sort of. So, so what we had finished with last time, you may recall, um, what we pursued last time was uh, analysis of the effects of vaccination. Um, and we examined in this model, this version five model that I want you to load up in any logic, ask students here to, to download it if you haven't done so already, or either load it up if you have it locally or download it from the site as uh, CMPT 394 SIRS version five. Um, what we had pursued was a set of, um, of structure uh, to account for vaccination. And uh, you may recall that this structure took the following form. Uh, so we had, and let me get rid of this cruft uh, here. Um, and, but we had a vaccinated stock. We had some level of vaccination that could occur over time. And then we had some fraction of the initial population that started vaccinated. Now, um, we set up a scenario that said half of the initial population vaccinated. And who here can describe what was the impact of that? There was a, a bit of textured discussion. I just want to make sure we're clear on, on what that impact was. What was the impact of that? And why did we see that impact? Who can mention some important changes to the outcomes if we uh, compare the baseline scenario, the reference scenario, to which we, who's, who's, to whose outputs we normally compare other outputs? Um, what was what was the impact of assuming half the population is initially vaccinated? Uh, yes, so uh, to Sif. I, as far as I remember, the number of infected was lower in the vaccinated one compared to the baseline, and also the peak for the infective were a little delayed, a little later on compared to okay. the main one. Yeah, that's right. So it flattened the curve, and there's a later peak of of infective. Um, good, excellent. Um, uh, so so uh, that's that's good. Um. Why did we see that? There, there was a, a comment, which I could well understand, um, that, well, you know, taking people vaccinated, putting them in the vaccinated stock is like taking them out of the population, removing them from the population, a, a certain amount of the susceptible. If we, if we have half the people starting here, it's like reducing the, the population by factor of two. But I... I, I sought to um, challenge that idea and and help try to refine it. Why did I challenge it? Why 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 is that not quite accurate? That it's like taking half the population and removing them, and so essentially you get a model or you get a system with half the population. Why is that not the case? Do you remember the reasoning here? It's a key point because it's only changed in the population of, of susceptibles. That's, that's true. That's true. And let me ask this. If we took half the population of susceptibles, so we put them in the vaccinated stock. Pardon me. I'm just going to um, just these curtains a bit. Um, uh, yeah, some fractions change. This is this is right. This is right. Yeah. Um, so so you're getting some ideas here the, the affecting the ratio of the rest of the population uh, with the ratio. Uh, and so how many people infectives can affect? Yeah, because look, if, if you just took half the susceptibles and they were to disappear, um, maybe they were to hide in their houses and have no contact with everyone, whatever isolate in their houses, have no contact. The, the infective would still be surrounded by, by um, all susceptibles. Um, 
and to be able to to infect them. And, and instead, what's uh, what's going on here is that by vaccinating people, infectives are surrounded by if we if we start with half of people vaccinated, that first infective, that patient zero, what fraction of the people around them are are susceptible at the initial time? What fraction? If, if we have patient zero, it's the single infective at the start. If we have half the population vaccinated, what fraction of the people around that initial infective will be will be susceptible? A half is exactly right. A half. It's only half of those people, so they're um, they're diluted. Now you, you could think, and and I appreciate the subtlety that here, because you could think, well, look, I mean, half the people around them are susceptible, and that leads to a net number of contacts per day with susceptibles, half of what of this entire contacts per day instead of the entirety of the contacts per day. So it reduces it by half. Yes, but the mechanics are, are different. Um, uh, the mechanics are different here because it's it's operating via a different pathway. It's not merely they're having uh, fewer contacts per day. You have this whole lower fraction of people susceptible. And those people stay vaccinated um, on an ongoing basis uh, and remain vaccinated throughout. And you may recall that a key throttle, a key limit on the, the, the outbreak, a key limiter of how large it can grow is the fraction of people that are susceptible. So this reduces it by a factor of two. If we were to simply remove those people, have the population of the model, we wouldn't be doing that. Um, we, we wouldn't be limiting it in quite the same way. It's subtle, but it's, it's a bit different. Um, and by putting them in the vaccinated state, we have a A, a lower fraction that are susceptible, which feeds directly into how many inf new infections can be caused by each infected. It essentially halves the basic reproductive number at the start. Okay, so that's good. And I asked, well, what if we change this um, instead of being half? What if we made this, you know, uh, a quarter, right, uh, of the initial population, excuse me, so so three quarters, uh, three quarters of the initial population vaccinated. And so we're going to change this to initial population, uh, infraction of population vaccine be 0.75. What do you think will happen now? If three quarters of the initial population is vaccinated, what fraction are initially susceptible, roughly? If three quarters are vaccinated, and there's only one piddling person, the infected, a pretty important person, but it's only one person. Yeah, a quarter remains susceptible. A quarter remains susceptible. Basically, everyone at the initial time, virtually everyone is either vaccinated or susceptible. If three quarters are vaccinated, the other quarter is, is susceptible. So what do you think the effects of this will be? Hmm? What do you think the effects will be, ladies and gentlemen? What do you think the impact will be? Anyone? Folks? Lower susceptible. Yeah, it will lower the susceptibles. Only a quarter remain. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking for something a bit deeper than that. What are the ripple through effects? What are the, the consequences of that? lower susceptible. How do they ripple through it? The peak for infect will be delayed further. Okay, I like it. Yeah. And what else? And fewer cumulative infections. Okay, good. Good. Is there going to be an outbreak still? There will be an outbreak. There will be an outbreak. And 
you know, it's helpful to think these things through. Ask yourself what you expect the results to be and then and then run it. So what we see is that, as normal, Sophia is right on, on target. There is an outbreak here. It's Is it a later outbreak or an earlier outbreak than before? It is later. It's a later outbreak. Is it smaller or bigger than before? Sm smaller or bigger than with the baseline? Smaller, much smaller, right? The baseline, this only goes up to about 5,000 people infected. If, if we did the baseline, we're dealing with a much larger fraction of people infected, right? Here we go, 150,000. Hmm? 150,000. We lowered it by having three quarters of the population vaccinated, only a quarter susceptible. Did we lower it by, so we've reduced by factor of four, the fraction that are susceptible. Did we reduce the peak size of the outbreak by a factor of four, or did we reduce it by even more than a factor of four, even more of an impact? This is about 160,000, do the math. If we lowered the fraction of people that are susceptible, it started by a factor of four, right? From basically everyone being susceptible to a quarter being susceptible, right? Only uh, and three quarters being vaccinated. So that's a factor of four reduction in susceptible. How about the peak size of the um, of the outbreak? Here it's about one hundred sixty thousand. There it was about 5,000, do you remember? And it was occurring much later, 5,000. It reduced by a factor of over 30, right? 150,000 to 5,000 be a factor of 30 times, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Five times three is 15, and you need another zero on 30, yeah, right? It reduced by much more than a factor of four. Reduced by over a factor of 30. It's different than just taking, having a smaller population. Smaller population you might think, well, it can be reduced proportionally, right? If we have one tenth the size of the population, then we will have one tenth the peak size of the upright. Here, it reduced it by a, a factor of, of 30. Hmm? Um, okay, so, so we're on a roll. We're on a roll here. Um, talk about bang for a buck, right? Have a quarter of the population, so three quarters of the population be vaccinated, get a reduction of 30 times, and you delay the outbreak greatly. You start to see the impacts of nonlinearity here. The results are just not proportional to how you reduce the, you know, the the, the reduction in the size of the initial susceptibles is not just proportional to reduction in the peak size of the outbreak. No, you get this kind of multiplier effect. Well, that, that's great. Um, so suppose we were to, to instead go yet further. Maybe imagine if we had 90%, right? Um, 90% percent of the initial population is vaccinated. Maybe that's a bit, uh, yeah, okay, sure. We'll, we'll say 90%. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll do 90%. What do you think? Do you think it will reduce it by a factor of 10? So we're reducing so with 90% of the population vaccinated, what fraction remains susceptible, roughly? What fraction of the population remains susceptible? Yeah, 0.1. So we've reduced the fraction that's initially susceptible via factor of 10. Do you think we'll reduce the peak size of the outbreak by more or less than a factor of 10? By more, yeah, we'll reduce it by even more. 
But it's not only that. T got it exactly right. The outbreak doesn't happen. The outbreak doesn't happen at all. Where's the outbreak? Where's the outbreak? Where? What's going on with infectives? That's what's going on. What's what's happening? What's happening here? Reproductive number is less than one. The reproductive number is less than one. We have achieved. We have we have achieved what is called. It was a term that was heard quite a bit in the uh, in the in the early phase of the pandemic, particularly as vaccination was being contemplated. We have achieved what herd immunity. No one person in this model. Um, so not everyone is immune in this model. There's no, there are some people who remain ten percent who remain subject to infection, but at a population level, the the population is immune to infection. You have that initial infective, and yet it's not you know that initial infective it's not that they don't infect anyone they if you look at cumulative infections there's some infections taking place but it peters out right it disappears it, it it's just a blip and it, it dies off because it's not sustainable why isn't it sustainable yes a single infected person infects less than one person over the course of their infective from the start so it's reduced the effective reproductive number and the basic reproductive I mean, the, the, the reproductive number at the initial time. It's reduced the the reproductive number to less than one. So as Teague said, a single infective infects fewer than one person or less than one person since so it's fractional over the course of their infection. We've achieved herd immunity. The infection dies out. It dies out before it gets started. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, good. Good. Um, so at what what is the critical fraction where we need it to die out? What's the critical fraction of people remaining susceptible? where the infection will no longer be able to take off. Teague said, observed, this is based on a single infected person infecting fewer than one person. You could also argue it in terms of inflows and outflows, but, but it's most common to conceptualize it as Teague did. Single inf uh, infected person infects fewer than one person over the course of their illness. What would the fraction of people have to be that are susceptible at the start? Or susceptible for for that single infective to infect fewer than one person, one over the basic reproductive number. Remember that? Because normally that single infective at the start infects how many people? At the start, that single infective infects how many people? At this normally and six people. Yeah, R zero, R R not. So normally, no vaccine, no one vaccinated, then in fact are not people. If half the people are vaccinated, they infect how many people? If if half the people are vaccinated from the start, they're gonna that single first infective will infect how many people on average? Three, yeah, three. But give me a formula. Yeah, 0.5 times uh, basic reproductive number. So if you just got it again. Right. And so if one over R not people are infected, how many people would they infect before they recover? If the fraction that remains susceptible, who are susceptible at the start is one over R not, how many people will they infect before they recover that initial infective? If they normally infect R not people, 
But now we're imagining a situation, because they're surrounded by all susceptibles. Now we're imagining a situation where only one over or not of those people around them are susceptible. How many people will they infect? And maybe I need to motivate this better. Okay, so Sophia observed, if half the people around that initial infective are, so, so let's do it from the start. If everyone at the, uh, if there's no, if there's no vaccination, that single infective at the start will infect how many people? If there's no vaccination, they'll infect how many people? We said it earlier. We said it above. I just want everyone to be on the same page with that. Yeah, R0. Good. R0. If half the people around that single infective at the start are vaccinated, how many people would they infect? Sophia had it earlier. If if 0.5, yeah, R over 2, or R0 over 2, it, it's or, or 0.5 times R0. If one-tenth of the people around that initial infective are susceptible. How many people, if one-tenth are susceptible around them? 0.1 times R0. Good. Yes, yes, yes. Good. And so if one over R0 of the people around them are infective, yes, one over R0 times R0, right? Which is one. If one over... If one over or not, if the people around them, that fraction, one over or not, are susceptible, that initial infective will only be able to infect one person. Because normally they infect are not people. And, and here they 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 only have one over or not of the people around them are are, are susceptible. So they're only going to infect one person. Mm-hmm. So that fraction, we need that fraction of people who are initially susceptible to be less than what? To be less than one over or not, which means the proportion of vaccinated needs to be greater than one minus one over or not, because it's the rest of the population. Hmm? Now, you can see this in the slides, but I just wanted to... Remind this, uh, remind you of this. So if I go to the slides here, um, here, ah, okay, um, here we go. Um, you know, uh, we, we get this success of production, right? And this key fraction of susceptible is, is S over N. It's this key governing parameter that, that affects or this key governing factor quantity. If we have fraction F of people versus remain susceptible, then the number of in fact individuals infected by an infective over the course of their illness um, by the index, by the uh, starting, i.e. patient zero, right? Um, uh, over the course of their illness is is F times this. So if F is one, they in fact are not people, that initial infective. If F is 0. 0.5, they in fact 0. 0.5, if the number times the number they would in fact, 0. 0.5 times R0. If F is one over 10, they in fact one tenth of what they would normally infect. If F is one over R0, they in fact one person because it's one over R0 times R0. That is the key fraction that have to be initially susceptible. And heck, in our model, everyone basically starts, with the exception of this one piddling, tiny, infective, important, but uh, important person, but, but uh, you know, an infinitesimal part of the population, basically everyone starts in either this state or this state. So if we want to consider, we need one over R0 of the population to remain susceptible, the rest one over one minus one over R naught um, uh, needs to uh, needs to be uh, remain vaccin to be vaccinated. So we need one over sorry one minus one over R naught of the population to be vaccinated. Okay, so suppose we have an infection like measles. 
where R0 is on the order of 20. It varies by population and crowded housing and you know, people's circulation patterns and, and uh, uh, factors associated with, with behavior. But imagine it's, it's roughly 20 for measles, super contagious. COVID gives it a run for its money these days. So suppose, suppose it's super contagious, about 20. What fraction of the population, if R0 is 20, what fraction of the population needs to be vaccinated so that we have herd immunity? If R0 is 20, Okay, sorry, I should, yes, 19, 19, 20, 0. 0.95, exactly correct, exactly correct. If R0 is 10, what fraction of the population needs to be vaccinated to achieve herd immunity? Yeah, 0. 0.9, 90%, exactly. And if you ever wondered why you go back and listen to people during the pandemic and they said, well, we think, you know, or we're shooting for 95% or 90% of the population being vaccinated or 75%. It was all based in this calculation. I mean, this is like the, the defining population. Now we're going to see when we have agent-based models and we actually have maybe clustering of people who are, who are not vaccinated. Um, uh, you know, pockets of the population which have more crowding and so on why the situation becomes more complex. But here, um, this is the sort of rough and ready, old, you know, standard way of, of, of roughly estimating what fraction of the population do we need vaccinated considering the population uh, as a whole. It gets more complicated once we consider different behaviors and different living situations and the tendency of people who are not vaccinated to group together and go to similar, you know, events or or engage in similar behaviors and and you know, uh, it, it, there's also, you know, considerations uh, involved with people with immunocompromised status and weaker immune systems and elderly, et cetera. So heterogeneity and homophily, people sticking together who are similar complicate this. But by and large, this is a very good rule of thumb. And it's the basis for countless pronouncements you would have heard during the pandemic about what we need to achieve herd immunity. And unfortunately, in Canada, we fell well short of that, particularly, I'm sorry to say, in our province. Um, but this is where we shoot for it. So if you're wondering why measles outbreaks are occurring again in Canada, are you wondering why, you know, pertussis outbreaks are occurring or chickenpox or, or so on? Um, uh, you should realize that in some communities, we don't achieve that fraction, for example. Um, this is basic guidelines that govern, you know, what people shoot for for vaccinated, um, vaccination status. Okay, so those are some principles on, on vaccination. I'd like to explore another matter here um, to expand your understanding. Um, but I want to emphasize what we've just seen is significant. It has to do with tipping points. It has to do with these points where same population, same bug, but if we can just get in a situation where we have, in this case, enough people vaccinated, or if we can intervene enough with masks and with social distancing, with quick diagnosis, if it's a treatment-mediated infection, or get people into quarantine or isolation quickly after they may have been exposed or were definitely exposed or were infected, it can lead to a tipping point of behavior, a situation where it's the outcome is totally different. It's qualitatively different. We can just invest enough to tip it over that tipping point. We can have dramatically better situations. Just a bit of investment more sometimes 
can make a world of difference, a qualitative difference. And recognizing those tipping points, ladies and gentlemen, identifying them and learning how to achieve that tipping point is one of the biggest uses of these sorts of models that you're learning about. Because we can't do it in our head. We can't just sit back and, and, and think about these things. We need to be able to reason about it. And you know, eventually we start incorporating in more and more factors and different age groups and different mixing patterns and 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 differential uptake of the vaccine and, and perhaps homophily and people coming together. And we use these models to build up robust policies and policies that that deal with possible contingencies and and we we use them to reason much more effectively than we could ever do in our head. We just can't keep track of, of all of these factors. And, and models are provide a much more transparent way than trying to do it in our head that communicate our assumptions to others and can be improved by being challenged by others. This is the craft of models. Okay, um, and this illustrates one of the big reasons for it. Okay, but let's now let's now look at another matter that, like vaccination, involves interaction with the with the care system. And I'm thinking I'm going to stop this recording.